Welcome to Under the Microscope, a stage for materials and nanoscience. This podcast is powered by the Science Talk team. Our goal is to provide a stage where scientists can communicate their work and interact with the public. With that in mind, with every episode, we introduce you to a scientist working in the field of materials or nanoscience. In addition to featuring on this podcast, every guest gets the keys to the Real Scientist Nano Twitter account for an entire week. Check it out at realsci underscore nano. All right, on to today's episode. Enjoy. Hi everyone, my name is Pranati. I'm your host of Under the Microscope. And today we have with us Antonio Manesco, who is a postdoc at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Hi, Antonio. How are you? Welcome to Under the Microscope. <laughs> yeah, hello. I'm very excited to be here. I've, I've been listening to podcasts for a while now, and it's great to be as a as an interview for, uh, person here today. Yeah. Oh, that is so cool. We are very excited to have you. Even if I'm still working on my first cup of coffee, I'm still, I'm, I'm still super, super looking forward to learning more about your science and uh, your life as a scientist. So let's start with understanding your current research. So what are you doing? What are you post talking about? Yeah, it's a bit hard to answer this question because uh, I don't think right now I have a very specific thing that I've been working on. Well, maybe that makes it easier actually to explain in general terms. Uh, so what I do uh, as a researcher is working mesoscopic and nano uh, electronics. So a uh, mouthful, so let me try to break this down. Well, I'm a physicist. I'm a theoretical physicist. I do computer simulations. And I work specifically uh, with electronic properties of systems. So that could be also how the electrons behave inside a material, or maybe things a bit more complicated, like a small electronic device. I don't, I don't really do things like big electronic components as in computers, but very fundamental uh, small pieces of uh, devices that do very simple things. So these devices are usually very, very tiny in the nanoscale, or maybe they have, so that means like a billion times smaller than a meter, 10 nanometers to one micrometer. Uh, so I do research trying to understand how these devices operate. So sometimes I look at the experimental works and try to understand how they are showing the features that they show, or I try to come up with new phenomena that people may be will be able to measure in those devices. And it's all theoretical. You mentioned this is all theoretical. So what are your tools? Like other than just just your laptop, your headphones, uh, what kind of tools do you use? What kind of softwares do you use? Yeah, actually that's most of it. Uh, I mean, we do a lot of coding in Python in our group, mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, could be any any language that you want really but uh, our group is mostly doing stuff in python and one of the reasons for that is that the uh, the pis in my group actually developed a python package for for studying electronic transport in these devices mm -hmm. so since we already use this tool that is built on python we just continue to use this uh, language as our kind of uh, default language to, to do coding. Uh, some of the calculations that we do are very expensive. So what we do is to send to a computer cluster that will perform because otherwise our laptops cannot do those calculations. And then I usually need internet connection to submit the calculations and let them run for a few hours or so. Okay, okay, interesting, interesting. So you write the code, on your computer, on your local computer, and then you send it to the analyzers or uh, is there like, uh, is it, how does it work? Is it like a company? Is it university? Is it, where do you send your code to, to do this analysis or do this testing? Okay, this is the data set. This is my code, run it through. Where, where are you sending this? So we, we have, two options. We have a, a small environment that we use in our group that is also not supposed to do heavy calculations, but we can run it online. So we have our own environment online 
and we not necessarily need to write code locally, but we can just access through the browser. We can we can have a I don't know if you were familiar with it, and also maybe the listeners are not, but uh, it's just a browser uh, a Jupyter notebook. So it's, we just write code in there and uh, we have access to uh, everyone in the group. And then from there, we can also send to a cluster that is, uh, I'm actually not sure if this cluster is in the university, but is a university rented at least, maybe they rent from a company. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, I think it's physically in the university, but they cannot assure that right now. Uh, anyway, we we sent to, to this cluster that is from the university, and the university uh, gives access to anyone in the department, really, like, uh, doesn't matter what, you, well, of course, you need to explain what you were doing in the cluster, but uh, once you, you tell the university what, what's your purpose, they, they will give you access regardless of where you, uh, what you were working on. So I think each department have, uh, there are computational facilities. And in our case, we have a, a, a dedicated cluster to run our calculations. This is so fascinating. This is a completely different world <laughs> for me. Because I, when I was doing research, when I was an active scientist, I was, a, uh, I was an experimentalist. I was doing experiments in the lab, getting the data, analyzing it. This is so cool that, wow, this is a completely new world. I don't know how it works. This is really fascinating. When we come back in just a moment, more about Antonio's journey into the world of materials and nanoscience. And hey, if you're enjoying this episode, you might also enjoy two of our episodes from season two of Under the Microscope. Episode number 36, which featured Charlie Wand, who spoke about his theoretical approach, which can be used from shampoo to LCDs, yes, these are all materials, and episode number 96 featuring Sheriff Abbas, who spoke about making materials modeling great again. Links in the show notes. Check those episodes out as well. All right, on to today's episode about simulating the future of quantum materials. Tell me about your career journey. How did you end up doing a postdoc now in the Netherlands uh, at TU Delft? How did that happen? Give me like your life story. Uh, well, I'm I'm Brazilian, as you said, and I did both my bachelor's and my uh, PhD in Brazil in the University of São Paulo, which I think, well, at least in Brazil, is the largest one. I think also maybe the larger or second largest in Latin America, even. Uh, they are everywhere in the state of São Paulo. Uh, they were still expanding actually they when i started my bachelor they just uh, incorporated the campus that i was studying and as a consequence they also created a new course that was uh, engineering physics and uh, engineering physics as a, a bachelor program was a very new thing in brazil actually there was only one other university that actually had a running course a running program on, on engineering physics and that got me very excited because, uh, you know, it merged two things that I was thinking about. One was like more fundamental aspects of physics and the other one was engineering and more like technology oriented uh, uh, studies. So I found the, the, the idea very interesting and then I started a bachelor's in there. And uh, then I also very early had the good idea that I wanted to at least try to do research. I had contact with a few people that were researchers and then I kind of got like the, 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 the idea of it. So uh, I tried to find professors already in my bachelor's that would uh, have me as a working somehow with them. And in Brazil, we have this program in Europe is not very common, but we have this scientific initiation program where bachelor students actually work just as they are uh, group members in a lab. You, yeah, it, it's actually really cool. You have like a you, it's usually funded as well, so you have one year long fellowship that you can uh, use to work in 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 any lab, basically. Yeah. 
And then uh, I started leading this program as an experimentalist. And uh, uh, yeah, so I joined uh, an experimental group doing superconductivity. Well, basically, very quickly, a superconductor is a material that has no resistance. Uh, you and can use these to generate very strong uh, magnetic field. Uh, so this group was trying to improve some materials to get even higher magnetic fields. If you make a wire with this material, it could reach even higher magnetic fields. And the reason is that at some point, superconductivity just breaks. When you reach some magnetic field, the material stops being a superconductor and just becomes a regular metal, just like a wire, uh, a copper wire that we have everywhere or something like that. But they were doing something tricky because they were using ceramic materials to make wires. And sounds very weird because like, how do you even do it? And the idea is that you make a very thin powder with it. And you just put on a metallic tube and you just stretch it. So then at some point it becomes a ceramic wire. And I was supposed to characterize this powder. So what we do is we compress this material up to a point that becomes like a pasty or something like that. And then I was measuring it. So most of my job was actually just cutting those samples and cutting ceramic is not an easy task. It breaks very easily. Uh, so at uh, this point I was like, okay, I don't want to be an experimentalist. I don't want my life to be like that. How dare you? It's fun. Antonio, come on. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was dramatic. Uh, <laughs> uh, but then I got really interested about doing the data analysis of it and uh, trying to understand how we could estimate the, the maximum field that those wires would operate by just doing measurements in these tiny samples. Yeah. And then that made me get more and more interested on, on the theoretical aspects. And my supervisor just let me study the, the, the more in-depth theoretical aspects and gave me some um, guidance yeah. to, to actually understand better the, the things that I wanted to. And then I, as uh, a follow-up project, and that, that took a year, and then uh, as a follow-up project, I really wanted to do something more fundamentally theoretical or at least change fields because I was very tired of cutting ceramics. And my my supervisor was like, okay, but I actually kind of want to work with graphene. I'm actually not so sure if we can make it here. I'm not sure if we have the proper facilities for it, but... Uh, I really want someone to actually study and try to write something uh, in terms of like maybe things that we could uh, start thinking about. And at this point, I was a more senior bachelor student and uh, my job became then just read papers, understand and discuss with my supervisor and also discuss how, how to actually even run experiments at some point if we wanted. Um, but uh, then again, I got way more interested about the theoretical aspects. And uh, yeah, then I learned the, how to calculate electronic properties. I got super interested about the papers. And then I kind of teach myself how to do uh, DFT. Uh, so for those that are listening, it's just a computational method to calculate electronic properties of materials. That's as much as you need to know. Right. DFT stands for dysfunctional uh, non <laughs> <laughs> What does DFT stand for? Yeah, DFT <laughs> stands for density functional theory. So it's a theory that says that you can actually, instead of thinking about many electrons in a system, you can just think about their density. Uh, and that makes things much simpler because then you have the system that has like a lot of information and just simplified to everything is contained in the electronic density. Mm -hmm. Anyway, then I learned how to do things and then I, I, I was almost uh, finishing my bachelor and then I was very confused on what to do at this point because I, uh, well, it was clear to me that I wanted to do research uh, as a PhD. But uh, I had no idea what I wanted to work with. And then I started just browsing uh, on the internet and trying to find something It was really like, well, okay, what can I do? Uh, also trying to check a few programs to see what they would offer. And then at this time also became clear since I was doing research for so long that I could also skip a master's diploma and, uh, and go to a PhD directly. Uh, this is not so normal in Brazil, it's kind of same thing as in Europe. Usually most people do a master's, uh, uh, get a master's degree before they, they go to a PhD. 
but I could do that if I stayed in, in the same campus and kind of with the same group. Um, but as I said, my group was experimental, so sounded like a fun idea, but at the same time, wouldn't be really a thing to do theoretical research with the supervisor that was not a theoretician. So that's when we partner with another professor that was in the department that was uh, doing high energy physics, but want to try something condensed matter. And we started working on, on thinking about things that we could uh, work. And then I started actually a, a course that is provided by the group that I'm in right now. They were teaching about topological aspects of uh, materials. No, what is it? I've, I've been meaning to understand it. Again. Okay, so so uh, let, let me... So let's just go for it. Yeah, yeah now uh, we are in it. So right. Let's just go for it. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, no mathematics and physics, though. I want to be able to understand this without having to need a second cup of coffee, Antonia. All right. So practical stuff. Tell well, me. Uh, materials have these properties that are related to how electrons behave. Okay, so a lot of properties, actually, how they conduct electricity, how they conduct heat, how chemical bonds are connected. Most of the things are actually related to electronic properties. And uh, because of that, you can also kind of like uh, studying electronic properties, you can also understand if a material is an insulator or a metal, for example. But the, there are different kinds of insulators, actually. There are insulators that are not an insulator in the same way as the air around us, for example, or the vacuum. Those are insulators of the same kind, let's say. But there are different kinds of insulators. And at, right at the interface of those two insulators, because they are very different, you actually need to transform from one insulator to the other. And that actually creates a metallic region right at the boundary of this system. Which two insulators? We were talking about vacuum and air. Yeah, well, so for example, a material that is an insulator now, yeah. which we call a topological insulator. Mm -hmm. So now if you place this material in a room that is like surrounded by air or surrounded by vacuum or anything, inside this material is in an insulator and outside is also another kind of insulator, but right at the interface, you actually need to have a metallic region. Oh, okay. So it's like if I have this cup, this is a topological insulator. It is in the air, but on the inside, it is a topological insulator. On the outside, it's topological insulator. But here... Yeah, the, the air, we don't call it topological insulator because it's trivial in the sense that it's like just a regular insulator. Uh, it's a very boring one, let's say. The air vacuum and, and all those right. things. Right, so the normal insulator is our air and topological insulator is our this fancy uh, material. And yes. their interface here is some stuff happening. Yeah, because, well, so insulators are known for having an energy gap. So an energy uh, range where we cannot really have any electrons. Yeah, we have a valence band and conduction band, which comes also from the orbitals and whatnot. But now if you make a, this topological material, this topological insulator, it has a gap that have a different kind of structure. And then to transform from the gap of this topological insulator to the normal gap of the air of, or of the vacuum, you actually need to close this gap and reopen it. When you close it, you make a metal. So right at the interface, you have something that is metallic and deep inside the material, it's still an insulator. And outside it also is also an insulator, but at the very edge it has these weird uh, metallic properties. For example, electrons don't, don't really feel disorder in this barrier because this needs to be metallic anyway, so you cannot really make the metal much worse than it is. Right. Kind of. So it's actually very good for, for electron transport and things like that. So why do we need this 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 interface, right? Why do we need this topological insulator, this magic that is happening at the interface between the topological insulator and the normal insulator, which is the air? What can this be used for? Why do we why why is this important? Why why can I use it in my phone? Like why? The interface yeah. can be as rough as uh, as you want almost, and the material will still have these metallic states. So, for example, you have very, very good electron transport, and you could try to use that to build a material where you have 
a lower dissipation than you you have in a in another kind of electronic device. So now thinking about actually small stuff because uh, you cannot really have a break of a topological insulator. It's not that I don't think that's easy to to fabricate. But if you have a very tiny material, you could think that you can actually transfer electrons from one uh, wire to another wire uh, very efficiently because these uh, edge states are very much protected. Okay, topological insulators. Um, th thank you very much for explaining it. It did, I, I think I understand them a bit better now. So thank you very much for the crash course uh, for me and for our listeners or watchers. Okay, so you so you found a group. Yeah, yeah. So topological insulators. Yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. So they were giving a, an online course on these topological aspects in condensed matter, and we we're like, oh, this might be fun. We can actually maybe try to. Think about a PhD project based on, on, on this stuff. That's actually how it, it went. So I had some experiments, uh, experience with graphene and, and superconducting materials. And we tried to actually understand whether we could use topological properties of, uh, well, actually make those materials topological. So my PhD started like that. And it kind of, of course, it changed, uh, uh, it changed a bit on the way, but I was still studying uh, graphene in combination with superconductors all the time. So um, yeah, most of my PhD was just studying these nano or mesoscopic devices made of uh, graphene. So for those who don't know, graphene is like the, the graphite that we have in our pencils is just a stack of many uh, sheets of carbon. Yeah, no, many layers of carbons. And if you isolate one of those layers, you actually have what we call graphene. So it's just a very thin layer of carbon atoms. And uh, it's also very interesting material where electrons move very, very easily. And then we were trying to combine them with superconductors to make electronic, tiny electronic devices. Uh, well, uh, not really focusing on any application, but just to study from a more fundamental uh, point of view. So this was during my PhD, and then, I mean, uh, the group was just starting. Uh, we kind of ju just got the idea and tried to work it out. So it became clear that uh, I need to go somewhere else to get more experience from actually a group doing active research on that. And that's how I came to Delft for the first time. Uh, we also had a program that allowed me to do a one-year internship in a group abroad. So I stayed here for one year, and then that's actually how I ended up as a postdoc, because then I came back to Brazil, defended my thesis, and then uh, then it became just natural to come back as a postdoc for a longer period and actually do things that were not just bounded by my thesis topic, but to other type of research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, interesting. So uh, from Brazil to Delft and then back to Brazil and to Delft, and I think you also spent some time in in the U.S. with some experimental group, right? So yeah, yeah, that, that was more recent like, coming to here. But since I had all this experience with graphene and superconductors, uh, I've been uh, was visiting last year a group in Cornell from Professor Vala Fatim. And they're uh, doing research exactly on this topic, but from the experimental point of view, they're combining graphene with superconductors and then was right to uh, help them to design the experiments. They're also just building the group now. Uh, Vala is a, a new professor in there, so uh, he wanted some some uh, to build up some ideas and have them in mind when they started running the first experiments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay, this is interesting. So you have had quite a fascinating journey uh, so far. Uh, and I think I know you do not want to do like cutting the superconductors because so not the experimental work, but you cannot escape it because you keep gravitating towards experimental groups or they keep uh, bringing you, like sucking you in. So I won't be surprised that next time you are on the podcast and we are talking about your research, you're like, well, actually I'm working in an experimental group now. I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if that happens, but this is great. I mean, the experimental and theoretical, they need to work hand in hand. I mean, this the, you can- Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I, I mean, I always, I was always interested in like interpreting experiments and trying to discuss as well with experimentalists, especially because my department in Brazil was mostly uh, focused on experimental physics. So it became very natural to me to just get contact with a lot of experimental research. 
and mm -hmm. then I now kind of need some experimental background always as kind of a motivation to start a project otherwise uh, it's hard for me to actually feel like I, I'm doing something that uh, you know but I, I really don't don't feel a lot of attraction for like very abstract research. I, I like to do something that is related to something that people are measuring or something like that. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah. That makes sense. And so that brings to mind uh, my next question, Antonio. You have been involved in a lot of interesting research projects, starting already during your bachelor's, even before starting the bachelor thesis. Mm -hmm. So. This is a tricky, or rather, this is a mean question. If you have to pick one research project that you're most proud of, or the most fun or quirky one, could you pick one and explain it to us in super simple words in the section we call In Other Words? Go for it. Okay, so I'll actually uh, try with a very few project that uh, the manuscript just came out on archive. And I think I'm uh, just because it was a recent one. I'm I'm feeling still attached to it. Uh, I think with time I kind of like forget of a few of my papers, and and this one is still very fresh. And I was also very excited with how the the, the paper came uh, to be. So what we were studying is a device to do quantum computing, but not the usual way people do quantum computers. So let me first explain what's the usual way to do quantum computing. So our computer have uh, like our laptops and cell phones. They have these. They operate with these things called bits. So these are just numbers, like zero or one. So we uh, we call these uh, pairs of numbers as bits, and and these uh, computers basically do mathematical operators with zeros and ones. Okay. And then when I go to a quantum computer, we could also think about having a quantum version of those bits which we call qubits mm -hmm. not very creative but yeah that, that's essentially how you kind of do quantum computer you kind of extend this classical concept to something that is fundamentally quantum and then things get more complicated you have some advantages and also some disadvantages but anyway that's the the way you you regularly do quantum computer uh, but now if you do like a Google search to, to know what you can actually do with a quantum computer, you find a lot of things like how oh, we can search for new materials, we can search for new drugs and for, I don't know, uh, the possibilities are, are many, but uh, one of the, the things that we could actually do with a quantum computer is so very complicated systems where electrons interact with each other. And that's usually what happens inside a material, inside a molecule. So that's kind of why uh, you see a lot of those applications for quantum computer because it's intrinsically very good at solving this specifically task. Qubits are not uh, the, the best way to do quantum computing if you want to simulate systems with many electrons because qubits and electrons don't behave the same way. So you could think about building something that behaves way more similar to an electron. An electron is a particle that is called a fermion. So it's a family of particles that behave very similarly called fermions. So we were trying to, to, to come up with a device where you can actually do what we call fermionic quantum computation, which would allow you, for example, to not have these problems, uh, that similarity problems between qubits and electrons, because now we start with something that is way more similar to an electron. And then mapping one thing to the other is actually very straightforward. When we come back in just a moment, how combining superconductors with semiconductors offers better control over electron hopping and their movement. Theoretically, of course. These quantum computers will definitely accelerate the research. More about that right after this quick break. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this episode. Please make sure to hit the follow button on this podcast under the microscope. I would also so appreciate it if you could leave a review. This costs you nothing, but means the world to me and our team. On to today's episode. Enjoy. So we actually did that by, again, combining superconducting materials with the, uh, now in this case, semiconductors. So there is actually three or four recent works here from Delft where experimentalists were working on, on a very similar system where you can actually control very precisely how electrons hop from very tiny region to another. 
So it can control how they hop to one place to another. And they could also make the way the electrons hop. You could, for example, make this electron go from one side to the other as an electron, or this electron could transform into a hole. So what is a hole in green? In... Hole is the absence of... Uh... Yeah, exactly. So you just remove an electron and you have a hole. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can actually control this process very coherently. And when we learn about it and uh, putting now in the perspective of uh, fermionic quantum computation, we realize that this device has pretty much all the ingredients to build a fermionic quantum computer. Mm -hmm. So our pro uh, this project was about uh, coming up with the very basic building block of what could be a fermionic quantum computer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Oh, that is wow. Okay. Okay. So can we do it? We can uh, write the paper. I, I'm trying to convince some experimentalists to actually measure because actually, I mean, the device is pretty much out there. They actually need to add the capacitor somewhere, which that, that might be tricky for them. We've been discussing about how to do that. But the, the devices are kind of ready for to measure. So I hope they actually are convinced by trying at some point soon. Okay, so if it goes according to your prediction, what implication will it have? Does this mean that my computer will be, I don't know, X times faster or my phone will be X times faster or like what, 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 okay, this is, this is really exciting. What, and also very conveniently, you're based in uh, Netherlands, which is where ASML is also operating from, I think. So what, what are the implications that, are, that we can expect if it goes as a, according to your predictions, like what will be the implication? I don't think uh, we'll have uh, quantum computers available as our personal computers anytime soon. Wow. Fine. Best yeah, case so, scenario. Antonio, we are doing best case scenario here. Yeah, I, I know, but I'm just trying to be slightly realistic. Sorry, I, I can also uh, try to 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 imagine a yeah. very idealistic thing, but just to give a an uh, explanation for people, it's just because you need very low temperatures to have a quantum computer. Like, and we were talking about like minus two hundred and seventy or seventy three. Uh, uh, below the room temperature mm, mm, mm. so it's very, very so we cannot just carry in our pockets but uh well say you have like uh, internet uh, access to a quantum computer and then your cell phone can just be connected to a quantum computer that uh, I, I still don't know how how, how it works because uh, quantum computers are good for specific Then also, even in this case, I don't think necessarily that would mean computers running faster, but rather we would be able to solve problems that we're not able to, which I think is not as exciting for people listening because it's not like you have a better computer, but scientists will be very excited about solving their own problems in this computer. So remember the cluster I was talking about in the beginning, maybe actually in a few years, we have a quantum computer running uh, things that we could actually use to solve specific research tasks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will basically accelerate the advancement of science and be any sort of data analysis or computing to some extent, right? It doesn't yeah, have to yeah. be personal computer, personal laptop, personal phones or anything like that, but basically advancement of science or with the data analysis, so to say, it it basically brings us so much faster to the next step or to to develop technologies which are needed which can then make the computers faster and like personal computers faster or your phones faster uh, or so but this is really really interesting so next time Antonio yes I'm going to bring you on the podcast next time as well um, another time as well and next time then you can tell me how how realistic uh how how did the experiments perform and what what uh worked what didn't work and then we can, we can... i hope so as well yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's how i went up inside the lab they tried to bring me in exactly yes see you're gonna <laughs> no, i'm kidding I, i'm not doing this but uh but i'm uh, but i hope i can convince these uh colleagues to actually do something similar yeah that that sounds that sounds amazing. Um, so Antonio, 
I I I have the feeling that you love the research part of being a scientist. Research does not mean on in the lab. It can, in your case, it means on your computer. Definitely. Mm -hmm. But what else do you like being uh, of? What else do you like about being a scientist, other than the science and the research aspects itself? Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, I actually think that uh, as uh, of course there are problems in the career itself, and, and I, I guess we can talk about that later on. But uh, uh, but I really like the the way we have uh, freedom to actually kind of choose the problems that we're interested in. Of course, we're somehow constrained by like get getting funding and things like that. But uh, it's much less constrained, for example, than working in an industry that is focused on delivering a product. We can now actually uh, figure out things that we are interested about and actually try to build our uh, research path based on, on our own interests and not only on things that people are asking us to do. Uh, so this is one thing that I really like and uh, throughout my, my my career that was very fundamental as I said in the beginning was an experimentalist and then I could I had the option to actually do theoretical research and learn from it and and that's how I actually got here. So I'm also very happy that I had this chance before. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so this is one thing. The other thing is that I really like to uh, work uh, with students in general. I really like the teaching aspect of it. Um, I like to have like uh, um, interaction with uh, younger students that come sometimes with no clue what, what they are doing. And then you have to break down their projects in very small pieces and explain them bit by bit what they were doing. And then you see this person that had no idea what was doing at some point is discussing like very complicated physics and bringing you uh, papers that you never heard about. And you're like, oh, wow, uh, that's great. Like you gotta have this feedback from the students that they're actually growing as, as uh, professional researchers this is something that I really, really like. Also the teaching aspect is something I don't know, most of my friends don't love to teach, but I actually had a lot of fun when I had to. Uh, and I think I really like interacting with students in, in general, not, not only in the research uh, uh, environment, but also uh, in classroom. Yeah. Okay, okay. I mean, you are a great teacher. I have to say, in my experience with you of less than an hour, <laughs> I already understand topological insulators and your research. So you are a, we are a really, really... Uh, okay, good, good. Good that I made it at least somewhat clear. Uh, it, it's hard to break those things in, in, down sometimes. Like when my parents try to understand what I do, I usually have a very hard time to to try to explain those things. But, you know, we also need to do this because otherwise people will never really care about what scientists do. So we need to somehow communicate in some sense. Absolutely. Totally agree. So, OK, yeah. let's talk uh, more about then what can be improved. So if you had three wishes to improve your research experience, Antonio, what would you ask for? And I'm not promising anything here, OK? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So... I, I, well, I think this one is very common in the podcast, uh, having a more stable career for postdocs, I think is one of the things that in academia really needs to be fixed as soon as possible. Uh, I think that the psychological implications of putting people in short contracts, uh, yeah. it's actually terrible for academia. And I really wanted these to be solved, but somehow I really don't have any, any <laughs> clear way to solve it, but, uh, it would be really nice if, uh, uh, people talk more about how to actually solve these because I, I see a lot of people really talking about the problem itself but I don't see many discussions on okay what can we actually do to to improve the life of these people and as I said I have no no idea on how to solve it but it would be great to 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 have these mm -hmm. uh, it's not something that I really face it but uh, here I'm actually uh, in a longish contract for a postdoc Mm -hmm. But uh, I see my friends around and they are all stressed about moving and and having to find a job in the last minute because they cannot really extend for sometimes even for a few months is a bit hard for them to extend. Mm -hmm. So this part is very annoying and I think academia should really be more involved to keep those people inside academia. Otherwise, these people would just leave and they are usually very good talents and we just lose them. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. This is your first wish, a better job stability. 
Uh, yeah. Two more. So second, I think, uh, well, this is something that I kind of felt more closely, uh, which is geographical bias uh, in academia in general. Uh, that can mean a lot of things. For example, I had referees uh, really attacking me personally in my papers, which I think is something that people would not do. Yeah, exactly. And I think I would not face these if it was not geographical bias. Also, um, I don't know, even visibility it's, itself, like you see uh, sometimes, and I'm not saying that people have bad intentions, but you just sometimes see people focusing on, on following a specific research group and they barely care about the other research groups around the globe that they're doing also similar research and maybe just as good, but just because they are not in the very famous university, people just don't care about them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, Geographical bias could mean like basically a bias, just like yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. The bias. in general bias would, would be uh, perfect. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm saying geographical bias just because something that I experienced, but the bias in general would be. Uh, I mean, there is no reason for us to to evaluate people based on, on where they come from that. or. Yeah. I'm really sorry that you had to experience it as well. Um, I mean, I think every person who uh, is not from the uh, who is not from the first world countries or whatever has experienced has at least one story of how they had to face uh, situations which were which they wouldn't have to face if they were uh, from a different part of the world or they look different or they uh, sounded different so um, I'm really sorry yep. to do that so first is the stability second is just equality I think it's just really yeah cool. yeah yeah that, that would, uh, would solve not only the, the problem that I, I listed but many others so it would be great actually equality would be amazing yeah uh, and then the last one I guess would be a better open science culture in academia uh, I guess it's a bit more specific because we, we do see people, uh, I think open science became actually a, a big thing now in Europe, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually see that even to get the funding, you need to have some open science uh, plan for your research and you have to disseminate these somehow. But uh, I think we're very far from any any reasonable situation. Let me just give you one example. Say you were publishing in one of those glossy journals that allow you to uh, have an open science paper in there. Mm -hmm. Then you have to pay 10,000 euros to do that. That's ridiculous. Like, why would you need to pay 10,000 euros to make a PDF online? That's absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are actually many uh, initiatives out there that are actually trying to change these and actually make like full open science journals, for example, where you don't need to pay both to publish and also to read. But not only that, but also, for example, uh, sharing code and data. Uh, I realize that every time that I try to reproduce a paper, I have a very hard time. And I also find mistakes in people's papers that would solve it if they actually made code available for, for referees to check and maybe give feedback on the code itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that would be great also for reproducibility of research. And... So yeah, I think uh, open science in general would also help equality because then people from from poor countries would also have access to things that they usually not necessarily have, um, but also for their reproducibility and also to to make better science itself. Uh, I think it's very important for us to to uh, take more steps on sharing uh, more information and not be just afraid that another group would have our data. This is whatever like uh yeah if you are doing creative research you don't really need to 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 worry about those things so yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely i completely agree with all three wishes of yours so stability equality and open science that's just like it sounds very simple and it sounds very basic that yeah obviously you need it but i think we need to keep highlighting it uh, also to keep the conversation going and also towards finding solutions um this is very very important i totally agree totally mm -hmm. totally agree so antonio this has been fantastic but before i let you go i'm going to ask you one last question 
Okay. What can the followers expect when you're tweeting from the Real Scientist Nano Twitter account, which is the second part of this material science project of ours? So in your week on Real Sci Nano on Twitter X or whatever the fuck it is called now, uh, what can the followers explain expect? Yeah, so I'll try to, to dive a bit more on those physics things that I try to stay slightly away during the podcast because I don't want to... Uh, <laughs> dive too much into the details uh so i'll try to give a, a more intuitive explanations of those things and i hope as well i share a bit of my daily life as a researcher so i'm also planning on do a, a bit of it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's essentially my plan try to to explain a bit more my research in terms of uh, more physics like give more more physics concepts to to the audience and also uh, share a bit of how my life works and how I, I realize that not many people know how a theoretician works so I'll, I'll try to share a bit more how is my daily life as a theoretician absolutely absolutely and in addition to the science uh, if I may request a few things please also tell us about the university you did your bachelor's in because I have no idea how the labs look like or how the university building looks like I don't know the campus anything at all so if you are able to get those pictures and share them with us that would be uh that would be really cool and of course also with depth and your life yep. just pictures of your life as a scientist just okay. life as a scientist that would be wonderful so thank you very much antonio this has been wonderful looking forward to having you now on real scientist nano twitter account thank you very much yeah thank you very much for the opportunity it was great to talk to you Thank you for listening to yet another episode of Under the Microscope. If you like this particular episode that you just listened to, feel free to check out our other more than 200 episodes with amazing scientists from all around the world, materials and nanoscientists. And do let us know what kind of science, what kind of material science you would like to hear more about, and we will try to get you a guest accordingly. Thank you for listening yet again. Really appreciate your support. And hey, do consider joining our mailing list. The details are in the episode description. Thank you. See you in the next episode. Bye.